So, good afternoon to Rosetta. How did Europe land on a comet? Well, obviously, Rosetta and Philae became very famous last year, um, but the adventure started a long time ago. Back in 2004, Rosetta was launched by an Ariane 5. So, 10 years in space, 10 years in space to start the main science phase of the mission. 10 years in space to get pictures like this one of the comet. This is a navigation camera image of the neck region of the comet. The cliff on the right-hand side is 1,000 meters high. Imagine being there. 10 years in space to get selfies of uh, Philae still attached to Rosetta with a comet in the background. This is actually not the first selfie of Philae. We jump back in time, 2007. At that time, the word selfie doesn't exist. This is 1,000 um, kilometers above Mars. It's like being in a plane. But how come we flew by Mars? Well, in space, it's quite easy, quote, to fly by an object, but to approach the object and stay with it for a long time is much more complicated. We use a technique called gravity assist. It's an exchange of angular momentum between the spacecraft and the, and the planet it's flying by. This allows to change the, the um, speed and direction of the spacecraft around the sun. On Rosetta, we wouldn't have enough fuel to do any of these four gravity assist maneuvers we did. We came back to Earth three times. We flew at Mars at 200 kilometers. What we're seeing here is this 10 years journey, um, <coughs> Rosetta on its way uh, to its um, uh, second Earth flyby. There'll be then a third Earth flyby, and finally we'll be on the orbit of the comet. It's the, this outer orbit you're seeing right now. You're seeing the comet approaching the sun. This was the last passage. Uh, we're now on the next passage. So Rosetta, third Earth flyby here, and then Rosetta finally on its same, close to the same trajectory as Rosetta. Um, as the comet, sorry. So this is 2009. But as you see now, we're going so far away from the sun that despite our huge solar rays, 64 square meters, we didn't have enough energy to maintain the spacecraft active. We had to hibernate it. So hibernating meant converting it to a spinner. A spinner in deep space is very stable. So we could switch off most of the subsystems and dedicate the little power we had just to thermal control and to a program which was checking regularly if it was time to wake up. In 2011, we had programmed a timer for 10, 10 UTC on the 20th of January 2014. So you can imagine, um, well, we actually, in, back in 2011, when we sent the final instruction to Rosetta to tell it, you're clear for hibernation, that was with the last we heard of Rosetta for two and a half years. No single contact for two and a half years. So you can imagine the stress was pretty high on the 20th of January last year when we were all in the main control room waiting for Rosetta to wake up. We had about a 30-minute um, window. At the end of that window, there's still no signal. Stress was even bigger. 17 minutes delay, and Rosetta said hello. Two spectrum analyzers, one in the States, one in Australia. Rosetta was back. That was amazing news. We, had, we knew nothing about Rosetta, how it had survived hibernation, how the instruments had survived the hibernation. So we started a phase called commissioning. We reactivated the instruments one by one. We re reactivated the platform subsystems one by one. And amazing news is everything had survived hibernation beautifully. So it was time to approach the comet, but first we had to find it. We had imaged the sky in 2011 as we would see it in 2014. And we did the same thing in 2014. This is a picture from the Osiris instrument, end of March. There's an extra dot there, the comet. The game started, where is the comet? So obviously, we found it. Um, this is a set of, uh, again, Osiris images. <coughs> You see the comet in red, uh, 60 seconds integration time on the left, uh, 120 seconds integration time on the right. We were in January 10 million kilometers away from the comet and a relative speed of 800 meters per second. If we don't do anything to that speed, it's a flyby. We wanted to approach the comet and stay with it. So we had to reduce that speed and also the distance, of course, down to zero. We use a technique called optical navigation. We compare the position of the comet uh, against the background stars. And this allows us to um, uh, reduce the uncertainty we have on the position of the comet respective to the spacecraft. To give you an idea, <coughs> the comet had only been observed by ground uh, observations. The uncertainty of in this orbit was about 10,000 kilometers. We wanted to go down to 10, yes, yeah, so obviously we needed to do something about it. We did a series of about 10 maneuvers between May and July. The first one was 
really extremely painful. Seven hours, 300 meters per second. We have very small thrusters. It takes ages to move the spacecraft. And it's really stressful being on console. Uh, the you feel the spacecraft shaking. It's really, really pretty scary. But finally, we were at the comet. This is our, a set of um, NAVCAM images between the 1st of August and the 6th of August. It's the first time we really saw the comet before it was just a single dot in our pictures. All the analysis was telling us that we needed a square kilometer for landing, because that was our aerial ellipse for a comet which was 50 square kilometers. So clearly, things were going to be challenging. Why this uncertainty? Well, the comet is an active body. We have 64 square meters of solar rays. It's like being um, in the sea with a huge sail. The, 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 the activity of the comet blows us away. It's easy to reconstruct where we were, but to predict where we were, to predict what the wind does on our sail is very, very complicated. Hence this big error ellipse. So you can imagine when we saw the beast and said, wow, that's going to be tough. So we were at the comet 100 kilometers away. We didn't know anything about it. This was August. We had to land in November. We had two months to figure everything out about it. Pretty challenging. Shape model, gravity potential, all the outgassing, find the landing site. We started with the pyramid orbits, what we call the pyramid orbits here on the, on the left of the screen. These are hyperbolic arcs, 100 kilometers, then 50 kilometers. They allowed us to um, approach the comet slowly, um, <coughs> feel the gravity pull of the comet, define a shape model, and as navigation was going pretty well, we went bound to the comet. We're bound orbits to the comet. This is what you see on the right-hand side. 30 kilometers, then 20, then 10. We fly on the comet with, um, again, optical navigation, but here we use landmarks. We identify landmarks on the comet, and uh, this allows us, knowing when we've taken the image, uh, to recalculate the relative pos position of Rosetta around the comet. <coughs> so this is how we navigate. We ad ad identify these landmarks. We take about 20 pictures a day, and we have to have the comet in our field of view. Otherwise, it means we're lost in space. We have to back off. The process, the software now, is all this processing, sorry, is fully automated. But at the beginning, this was new software. It's never been done in the world before. So there's not little trust in the software, so it was also done manually by some of my colleagues, like class. Um, this is an example of aids um, they needed to make sure that we we're looking at the right landscape, height maps, different uh, viewing conditions, albedo map. And this is the, the beast there, that landmark here. You can clearly see that dif with different illumination conditions can be pretty, pretty difficult to identify. Once you have enough height information and albedo information of a landmark and the region surrounding it, you can create what we call a maplet and then a 3D view of a maplet. What can you do with maplets? If you have many maplets, you stitch them together, you get a shape model. This shape model was made within just a few days after arrival at the comet, still by my colleagues from Flight Dynamics. These guys are absolute geniuses. What can you do with a, a shape model? Well, you can simulate images. Real image versus simulated images. Here, you can still see the difference. Today, you wouldn't see the difference at all. Why would you need to simulate images? Well. <coughs> If you cinema Im images, you can predict how your optical navigation will look like. We're in search for a, of a landing site. We needed the landing site to be interesting scientifically, of course, but we also needed to be able to land on it, meaning trajectory both for Rosetta and Philae. And we all based everything on our optical navigation, so we needed for all the trajectories we were analyzing to make sure we would have valid optical navigation images. So after two months of all this comet analysis and um, also finding a la landing site from a um, few tens of landing sites down, downgraded to a five, section of five, and then two, it was time for landing. Here on this slide, you see all the go now goes we had, uh, starting from, about, from um, about minus 20 hours from T0, T0 being the separation time. We started the process early because we had to make sure we still had a valid trajectory for um, both Rosetta and Philae. We had a theoretical trajectory for that landing site, but who knows how much we'd been displaced by the comet due to its outgassing. The first go no go was a, a clear go. Then minus eight hours, Rosetta. Rosetta behaved actually beautifully throughout the, the, whole, the whole phase. Rosetta was a clear go. I'd arrived on console shortly before that time, and things were, feel like were not looking that good. And to me, it sounded like we would definitely be no go. By some miracle, um, with, with a lot of work also with the Philae team, of course, we were able to meet that Philae go no go, but much later than minus seven hours, around minus five hours from separation. And you have to realize 
that beyond minus four hours on board Rosetta, there's not a single instruction. There's absolutely nothing. 30 minutes propagation delay, 30 minutes for a signal to, from Rosetta to us, 30 minutes for us to send an instruction to Rosetta. We had a maneuver at minus two hours. This was a maneuver to put us on the right trajectory for separation points. And we had a go no go at minus one hour. We had to make sure that that, was a, that maneuver had worked perfectly. A 1% error on that maneuver would mean that Philae would not touch the comet. And of obviously, this was absolutely unacceptable. Um, so we had this go no go at minus one hour, 30 minutes propagation delay, another stressful go no go. But separation took place. Rosetta had to do uh, various stuff am among repositioning itself to make sure it had full visibility of the full descent of Philae to its landing site, seven hours descent. And this is the first picture the Osiris instrument sent back to us at plus two hours. Amazing picture. Clearly, separation had happened. Rosetta, uh, Philae fully deployed, gently spinning down towards the comet. And these are the last pictures of Philae we have. Bottom two on approach. The top two there, uh, a picture before landing, clearly no sign of Philae. The picture right afterwards, clearly a sign of Philae, three footprints. Obviously, there's something missing. We all know Philae bounced off, and what the last we've ever actually see, saw of Philae is the top picture on the right hand side. Philae, by some miracle, still managed to land on the comet and still talk to us. It actually achieved 80% of its scientific mission, which is a remarkable number. If you can look at the risks involved in this landing and the whole Rosetta mission, this picture here is its landing site with the pristine material in the back. You see a foot of Philae and you even see um, um, uh, a part of its, uh, one of its arms on the bottom right. So this is a remarkable picture. We're still looking for Philae today. <coughs> OK, sorry, so one more step back. This is my console position in the main control room. The main control room is a kind of a magical place. And there's no outside light, so you don't really know if it's daytime or nighttime. And sitting there on console with live telemetry, live science from Philae, flowing on our screen's bottom right there through Rosetta, more than 500 million kilometers away, is absolutely mind-blowing. There are only 12 in the world to have ever lived this. We're still searching for um, Philae. Um, we're down to this blue strip there, thanks to triangulation with another instrument on board Rosetta called Concert. You have to realize it's a difficult task. Um, we went back down to 20 kilometers to the comet after landing, while well, Philae is just a meter. So on images, Philae is less than a pixel on our navigation camera um, um, uh, uh, cameras, and uh, one to two pixels on the Osiris cameras. So it's really, really little. And there's actually, we actually find many Philae on the surface, as this one here. A white dot there, could that be Philae? Well, that white dot was there before. So this cannot be Philae. So <coughs> um, we're also looking at all the, the data we've accumulated with Philae to try and identify it. There's a, there are some better candidates than others. It's still a, a tedious process, a process which is still ongoing. And we've also started to listen for Philae. The third attempt finished two days ago. There's still no news from Philae. So 2014 was mainly dedicated to um, comet arrival, Philae release. But the actual main science phase of the 12 other instruments on board Rosetta just started after that. The comet is on its way to the sun. It'll approach, it'll be close its approach in August this year. So obviously Rosetta is following. So all these instruments are studying the way the comet is evolving with time getting closer to the sun. And then we'll follow the comet as it leaves the sun afterwards. We're able to stay bound to the comet for a, a few more months till February, down to 30 kilometers. And then the comet has become so active that we've had to move away. So this is why you see these uh, flyby arcs there. And actually, we've hit um, another problem more recently. The comet has become more so active that there's a lot of dust around the spacecraft if you fly very close. This perturbates our star trackers. Star trackers are units which look at the, uh, the field of view and identify the stars. This allows Rosetta to posi position itself in space. But with so much dust, the star trackers are unable to work. The, the star trackers don't have an, any issue. They're um, uh, operating according to specification. But this is just a fact. So we've had to move further away from the, from the comet. We're actually now between 120 and 180 kilometers from the comet. Another example here with uh, Osiris catching a jet forming within two minutes. The two pictures there are just separated by two minutes. Jet forming from the bottom unillumated part of the comet. Another amazing picture. 
if you want to follow us, one of the nice places is the Rosetta blog. There's a lot of articles, also scientific articles, which have been also a bit simplified. So they're very, very easy to follow. And I have a bit more time, so I'll show you three bonus pictures. The first, <laughs> the first one is the um, first uh, close flyby we did on the 14th of February this year, down to six kilometers of the surface. The shadow you see there is the shadow of Rosetta on the comet. It's absolutely an amazing picture. Um, there's a lot of science done during that, um, uh, that close flyby, but it's also when we started having trouble with the star trackers and I actually sent, spent my St. Valentine with Rosetta. Um, this is another picture I like a lot, this, um, this shape there on the, on the head of the comet. It looks like an access door, an access gate to the comet. And if, if you actually rotate it um, and combine it with uh, um, images of the same, same moment, you get this video here. It was taken in August last year, so it's quite old, uh, 100 kilometers away, but I still find this video fascinating. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for your time.